Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I also uh, want you to uh, leave a bookmark there or hold your place there and go to Galatians chapter 5. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is what we'll be uh, uh, learning from today, but I want us to read the fruits of the Spirit and the fruits of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. I'll give you the verse in a minute. So we're going to pick up here in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, 5 16, and we'll read till the end here. So let's read. Galatians 5 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are, he's going to, Paul's going to give us a list here, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, verse 21, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, notice the drop-down list here now, and he starts off with love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, Lord, uh, Father, we, we're here, Lord, before your, your feet again, Lord. And uh, we ask that, that you would uh, minister to our hearts this morning. We ask that you would uh, uh, plant... Uh, the seed in our hearts, Lord, that it would uh, take root, Lord, that you will remove any callousness, any, uh, any, uh, any bitterness, any, uh, any hardness, Lord, that will not allow uh, the word to take uh, root in our hearts, Lord. We pray that you um, also encourage us, Lord, exhort us, protect us, Lord, take care of the children next door and the youth as well. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so Galatians chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters because... I like uh, when Paul just gets to the point, when he, when he gives us lists, when he makes these contrasts, he gave us a, a list of the, of the fruits of the flesh there that we read already, right? Drunkenness, revelries, um, uh, outbursts of wrath, jealousy and envy, and all those things, you know? But Paul, those fruits, you don't have to, you, those fruits come included, okay? When you're born, they come included. You don't have to teach a baby how to, how to be uh, jealous of another baby that's playing with their toy. It, 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 it just happens, you know? My daughter the other day, I think it was yesterday actually, um, the baby, the one-year-old, she was sitting in my wife's lap, she's facing my wife, and then my oldest, my 12-year-old, puts her arm around my wife's neck, and she starts hugging her, while well, the baby starts pulling her arm, she's like, that's, that's her territory, right? It's like, you, we didn't teach her that, she, she comes with that already, that's the flesh, right? And we all have that, right? We have, uh, uh, you know, sin, we, we were born with sin, right? So, but when you became born again, when you were born from above, as John chapter 3 says, where Jesus says, you know, you got to be born uh, again. When we became born again, we became alive in the Spirit, okay? As opposed to before, where we might have been uh, uh, walking and talking, but we were more like the walking dead because we, we weren't quickened in the Spirit. We weren't regenerated. We weren't saved yet. So now that we are in the Spirit, we are to walk in the fruits. We are to walk in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit... If we pray, if we go to church, if we fellowship, and so on, Acts 2.42, 2 
we do that, walk in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh, okay? We're not going to do the things that we're already inclined and prone to do. And that's what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5. But I also believe that, you know, when you get saved, there's still things, you know, the Lord is working out in us. The more mature you are in the faith, the more uh, years you have been walking with the Lord, the more loving you will be, the more like Christ you will be. I think that's a, something we can all agree upon, right? The more mature a believer is, you're going to see more love. There's something different about that guy, as opposed to maybe somebody that got saved yesterday. So there's more love for God. There's more love for people. You see that. And, and Paul now, he's not moving away necessarily from um, the gifts of the Spirit, because we've been talking about the gifts, the diversities of gifts. So we're all part of the same body. Maybe you're a nose, maybe you're an eye, and a foot over here, a hand over there, right? We're all part of the same body. We, have, we all have different gifts that we didn't choose. God chose to give us. It, it's up to him. It's his will. But those are the gifts. What about love? Is there, is there a fuel behind these gifts? And unfortunately, with the Corinthians, because that's who's, who Paul is speaking to here, writing to here originally, there wasn't any love. There was a lack of the fruits but there was an abundance of the gifts, okay? And in chapter 1, I think he says, you know, you guys come short and no gift. He was, he was sort of praising them because they had all the gifts or an abundance of the gifts. But then in the next chapter, I believe he says, you know, but you guys are babies. You guys are, are still drinking milk when you should be eating meat already. You should be, you know, uh, putting legs on doctrine and, and walking out, you know, working out your salvation with trembling and fear. So Paul rebuked them for that. And he uh, praised them because they did have gifts. And that's one of the things we're going to look at here. It's interesting that Paul, chapter 12 is about the gifts mainly. In chapter 14, he continues with gifts, specific, specifically tongues and prophecy. But right in the middle of chapter 12 and 14, he emphasizes love. Because that's what we need to have. And, and that is the main emphasis he wants to give us. And he sort of left us with sort of like a clinger and, at the end of chapter 12 there, right? You know, the, the, the best thing, which is, which is love, the most excellent thing, and now he sort of gives it to us here in this, uh, in this chapter. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Even love as well is, is, is a grace. Okay? It's, it, it's, it's a constant grace. It's something that we, we grow and we can you know, um, develop in our, in our lives. But it's also something we can choose. You know, love isn't like uh, uh, so much of a feeling as much as it is a choice. Love is an action, right? Jesus, Jesus told us, you know, um, husbands at least, you know, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Well, there was an action there. He, he read Philippians chapter 2, how he, 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 uh, he left heaven, he left perfection to become a man, right? He humbled himself to the fullest, right? He became a, a man, yet being equal with God. But he became a man. So there's humility there with love. There's an action there. And he died on the cross for our sins. So, so then love is not a feeling. It's an action, right? i got to choose to love somebody. Jesus didn't say, uh, uh, love your neighbor as yourself if, if you feel like it. Or if you have your, you know, love your neighbor as yourself after you have your first cup of joe in the morning. He, he, he just said, do it, right? He didn't say, deny yourself if you feel like it today. No. He says, deny yourself, follow me. It, it, feelings are not, you know, even... In the equation, there they shouldn't even be any any factors. He even said, "By this they shall know you are my disciples if you have love for one another, not how talented you are, not the gifts that you have." So there's a difference between the biblical love, which is agape love, the love we see in, in, in throughout the scriptures, and maybe uh, you know, a romantic love. Because sometimes when we think of love, we think of Valentine's Day, we think of which is coming up, guys, ladies. Um, we think of hearts, we think of, uh, you know, pink and, and, and red and all that, and, and that's fine. We, we get our, 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 the Greek word for, um, our, our English word erotic from the Greek word eros, and that is, that, that is also love as well, but that's more of a confined love to, to a husband and a wife, okay, the eros love. And then we have phileo love, which means the brotherly love, that's what the city of Philadelphia is named after, right? There's that, that camaraderie type of a love between, you know, two people of the, of the same sex, Friendship type of a love. BFF type of a love. And then we have storge, which is basically like a family love, right? I love my, 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 the way I love my son, the way my wife loves her daughter, and so on. It's, it's, there's different kinds of loves, but nothing compares to the agape love, the love that Jesus came to show. That love is not pretty. You know, that love, is, is, it has nail-scarred hands. That love, sometimes, you know, Jesus' face was unrecognizable, the, the Bible says. Mel Gibson, you know, you still recognize uh, Jim Caviezel and the Passion. But in, in the Bible, it was more, more uh, gruesome. You couldn't even recognize 
His face. That that that's love. Love isn't always pretty. Love is sacrificial. That's the love we wanna we wanna see. That's the love Paul is gonna Paul is gonna talk about here. I broke down this message into three parts. But first, we're going to focus on the first uh, three verses here, which I titled, Love Has No Equal. And this is where Paul is sort of going to um, uh, contrast um, certain gifts with no love. Okay? The main ingredient is love, but he's going to take out the love and see what happens. It says here in verse 1, Paul says in um, 1 Corinthians 13 now, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become Sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I speak with the tongues of men or of angels. Now, what is that? Tongues of men or angels? I think he's referring to earthly language, earthly languages and to heavenly languages. I think he's, he, he, he starts off by talking about the gift of tongues here. He could be referring to uh, the public uh, gift where someone speaks in tongues and then somebody else interprets it uh, in a different dialect, that is. Or he could be, and he can be referring to the, the private prayer language, which some of you who have that gift know what I'm talking about. That prayer language that you don't understand what it is, but you're praying to God in your own private time. It, it, you know, just to give you the other side here, some cessationists, those that teach that the gifts have ceased, they say that right here where it says tongues of angels or tongues of men and of angels, the angel part is Paul making an exaggeration of the text, saying, well, tongues of men and tongues of angels. I don't, I don't think that fits with the context. I think there are actually, you know, that angelic language. And then it says, but have not lava have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And what that means really is, is basically instruments or you're making noise. You're not really making music. What he's trying to say is, look, you can be the most eloquent speaker or have the most uh, public uh, speaking gifts, but without love, it's just like a bunch of noise. It's like not being able to sing, but, you, but you're in front of Simon Cowell and, and uh, who, you know, what's the song, what's the name, American Idol, right? And you can't sing, right? It's not something beautiful to anybody's ears. You might think it's cool. You might think you can sing, but without love, he says, it's just a bunch of noise. Some translations say it's like a, a noisy gong or a reverberating uh, sound or symbol. And that's what Paul is trying to say here right off the bat. And now he compares uh, a couple other gifts here. He says prophecy. He talks about knowledge, and I think he's talking about the gift of faith here as well. He says, you know, it, let's read that verse. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing, he says. Even if you have the gift of prophecy, knowledge, and, and you know, an abundance of faith, without love it's nothing. It's like Elijah. Let's, let's start with the prophet, right? Elijah the prophet, we, we, he did a lot of great things. He said a lot of great things, right? But Elijah, without love, he's, he's a nobody, is what Paul is saying. Um, who, who was wise in the Bible, right? Solomon? We don't, imagine having Solomon's uh, knowledge and wisdom. Without love, Solomon is a nobody, is what Paul is saying here. And, and faith, who had big faith in the Bible? Well, a lot of people did. But let's look at David, David and Goliath. David had giant faith, faith to defeat Goliath. He had faith that God was going to give him the victory. That is giant faith. But even David, without love, is really a zero. He's not a hero. He's a zero. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what you can say, or what you know, knowledge there. It, without love, it, it, is, it is useless. It is, it is nothing. It is nil. It is a cinch. He says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me Nothing. It profits me nothing, he says. Now, I think right here he's referring to maybe the gift of giving to an extreme. Again, I think this is an extreme here. Um, somebody that has exercised their gifts to, uh, of giving and just sold all their possessions and given it to the poor. And then it seems like the second gift here is someone who, who is, a, is a martyr or has been given that grace to give up their life for, for the Lord Jesus, maybe a missionary. Mm, I don't know, but what Paul is trying to say is, even if, let's say you won the, what was it, the biggest uh, lotto? 1.5 billion. Let's say you were that person that won that amount of money. And uh, you cashed it and you gave it to the poor. If there was no love behind that, it is profitless. You're not going to get any re reward in heaven for that. If, if let's say, uh, you, got on, you packed your bags, you got on a plane, and you uh, flew to Iraq or Syria, and you went to an uh, ISIS-infested town, and you started to preach the gospel, and you were martyred or burned alive for your faith, but you did it without love, 
it didn't you don't get a reward for that is what Paul is saying your reward is actually going to burn up the same way you burned up here and, and that's that is something to take note of here because Paul is trying to make yeah I think there's a little bit of exaggeration here but even so even though he elevates the gifts when they're compared to love they come short and that is our first point when we exercise the gift of the spirit without the fruit of the spirit we will always come short and, and what we do then is we're sort of forfeiting the, the person of God, because the Bible says God is love. We forfeit the person of God. God is love, and the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. We forfeit that for the performance of God. It's like saying, I want the power. I want the gifts. I want to be able to do this and that. I want to be an eloquent speaker or, 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 you know, or be able to have faith that move mount, moves mountains, but I don't want the, the love that comes with it. I don't want the responsibility of having to love people. You know, I'll sh I, I can be pretty transparent sometimes from the pulpit. When I started teaching here, which wasn't that long ago, as a senior pastor, that is, it was in 2013, June 2013, and right off the bat, one of the things that I used to do was, um, you know, I would teach, I love teaching, but I didn't really love the people, okay, in the sense that after I got done teaching, I was out the door, I would go to the children's ministry or whatever, and I didn't like the, you know, conversation, I, I don't want to deal with the, the other stuff that comes with ministry, you know, and a lot of us can be like that, we want to be teachers, we want to tell people what to do, but we don't want to have any relationships, and that I was missing the love, and I think the Lord has given me that and, and, and has changed me in that. I mean, we're always growing in love, but that's just an example of forfeiting love for, for the gifts. You want to have both. You want those two to work together because, you know what? Love is the main ingredient. Imagine if love was like this, this uh, not, not love, uh, the exercise uh, of the gifts without love. Imagine that was uh, likened to a cupcake missing an ingredient. I'm not a cook, okay? I cannot cook. I don't have that gift. My wife does. That's why the Lord put us together. Um, no, but, um, but a cupcake without the eggs will not bond. If, if you forget to put the eggs in a cup in the mixing thing there, the batter, um, you won't have, they, it won't bond. The, egg, the eggs are what help the, the cupcake bond. It's not going to bond. Uh, and then the middle is just going to be full of hot air. It's going to be hollow. Uh, if, if you miss, uh, let's say, the baking uh, powder in the cupcakes you it's going to be flat it's going to be hard on the outside as well if you forget to put margarine or butter it's going to be um puffed up it's going to puff up but it's going it's not going to be it's going to be hard on the inside but puffed up on the outside right so all these are key ingredients to making a cupcake likewise in our lives if we don't have love and we're exercising gifts then we're going to be bitter on the outside. We're going to be just big heads full of, uh, with full of hot. Uh, we're going to be full of hot air on the inside. You know, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be a bitter, hard person and have all these gifts. You want to exercise them in love. And that's what Paul starts off by saying in the first three verses. And then he moves on to verses four and seven. Here I titled this section, Love Is and, and Isn't. Now, Paul is going to give it to us in his own order. But I want to—I changed it up a bit, and I'm still going to give you all, list all the gifts. But we're going to look at what love is and what love isn't, because he sort of mixed them up together. We're still going to cover them all, but I'm going to give them to you in uh, uh, how I listed them here. Let's go ahead and read the verses first. He says in verse four, "Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil or." No holds record holds no record of wrongdoing does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things now in verses verses four to seven are pretty popular maybe you heard it at, at, at weddings when somebody's officiating a wedding they they'll they'll quote from here you know these verses make a good um, living room decoration as well but Paul wasn't right when he wrote this. He wasn't writing a minister's manual to officiate a wedding. Okay, he was writing to the Corinthians, and this was sort of a rebuke because what he's saying here, this isn't a, a, an exhaustive list, a list of what love is. Love has more characteristic than characteristics than this. But what he's trying to say is, look, this is how love look like, looks like, and this is what you guys look like. So they are the opposite of the positive things here. For example, you can read it like this: The Corinthians are impatient. The Corinthians are unkind. They envy one another. They parade themselves in their gifts. They're puffed up and rude, always seeking their own, easily provoked, always keeping score of who does what, rejoicing in immoral behavior and not the truth. They do, do not bear all things. They are doubtful, hopeless, 
and lacking endurance. And I know you probably heard many pastors say, well, you know, just re replace love there and put your own name in there and see where you're coming short. I know I come short. I know I don't, I'm not doing this, but you know what? I'm not giving up. You know, I want to continue to be able to love like Jesus, right? So Paul here is giving us an example of what they were not. And you, you can replace love there with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, and it makes a lot of sense, right? But Paul wants us to be like that as well, to display that type of love. You know, studying this really cut me to the heart because, you know, we, we, we come short always. But that's good. You know, for the Christian, that, that when we bleed, we should bleed worship. We should bleed a change in our lives. Let's break it down here. He starts off by saying love uh, is. Let's start off with the is. He says love suffers long or, or is love suff suffering. The Bible says that God is love suffering. Uh, God is long suffering in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That's a characteristic of God. And, that, and God is love, so it makes sense. This is going to be characteristic of love, a fruit of love for that matter. Now, suffering long doesn't mean that you're just patient, okay? Oh, I have the gift of, or the... I'm very loving, so that's why I'm very patient. It doesn't mean that you can, you can wait at the DMV for an hour or two hours, and it doesn't mean... You're not long-suffering just because you, you're, you're waiting in, in line at Starbucks when it's like two minutes for church to start. No, that doesn't make you long-suffering. This implies longevity. This is, this is something unique because we need long-suffering in our everyday lives because some people in our lives are there to stay. Some people that make you uncomfortable. Some people that are not going to leave anytime soon that the Lord has purposely left them there in, the, in your life. Maybe to produce more fruit in your life. I don't know. Um, there are some things that are not going to change. Some circumstances in your life right now, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a disease. Maybe you're going through some stuff right now. So long-suffering is what you need. You need that love right now in your life so you can be able to endure through it and latch on, cling on to the Lord. That's what long-suffering is. That's what, that's what it means for love to suffer long. I need that. We all need that. And then he refers to love as being kind. Now, this is not merely being nice. This is not uh, uh, just uh, being a nice person. I think an atheist can be a nice person. A, a, moral, pers a moral unbeliever can be nice. And this is not something that you can duplicate. This kindness, the word here in Greek, really uh, literally means, at least the root, it means uh, usable, okay? So somebody that is kind, biblically speaking, is somebody that is looking to be used, that is looking to be of service to others, okay? When I'm kind, I'm looking to see how I can serve somebody else, not myself, but other people. So this is, this is different. You know, when we are, uh, when we think before we do something for someone, when we're trying to be kind, when we say in our heads, what am I going to get out of this? If we're thinking, what am I going to get out of the situation if I help them? then that's not the biblical kindness, okay? That's, that's more of a selfish thing, okay? So when you exercise biblical kindness, you're just going to do it to bless others regardless of what you get or don't get. And then we see that love rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. Why even include that there? I mean, isn't it something that we should already understand, rejoicing in what is true? But Paul includes it because, you know, the reason you rejoice in the truth is because of the Holy Spirit has done in your life. For example, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says his word is truth as well. Those are two things right off the bat, biblically speaking, that we know we should rejoice in. Paul also says, you know, uh, meditate on these things, these things that are praiseworthy, things that are true, right? Fill your mind up with these things. And, you know, that's, that's something we can take to heart. Because a lot of people meditate on things that are not true. You know, just, I went to college here for a couple of years uh, at AWC, you know, and you're going to get a lot of lies. You know, you're going to get uh, fed a lot of uh, lies, maybe about evolution, maybe a lot of criticisms about why Christianity is not true and this and that. There's an agenda, okay? And if you don't know it, you know, find out. There is an agenda out there to deceive. There is a lie. You know, the Bible says that Satan is the deceiver of the world. There is a lie out there. So then we should all the more rejoice in the truth, emphasize the truth in our lives. And then he says, love bears all things. What does that mean? And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not going to be a doormat. A lot of times we think, oh, that means i got to be a doormat. That, might, that means i got to put up with this person all my life or whatnot. It doesn't necessarily mean you got to be a doormat, but it does mean that we are going to cover all sins. Because see, the literal word here for, for bears all things means to cover all things. And that's a little bit different. Maybe you got a different translation, a more literal translation that will show you that. But it's like Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8, 
and above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins even in the Old Testament it says hatred stirs up strife but love covers all sins so the word here for bears is actually covers it, it's different okay for example in the Old Testament Noah right you all know about Noah and his nakedness and then his son Ham he sees his nakedness instead of covering it up his covering up his indecency and his sins he goes and he publishes it to his brothers he publishes it to the world because back then that was the whole world his brothers and a few other people there but do you see what happens there his brothers instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, just going along with the gossip and the ridicule they grab a blanket and they walk backwards they don't even look at their father's nakedness and they just cover him up that's a picture of love guys that's what I think Paul is trying to say here that uh, love bears all things it means it, it, it doesn't mean that we ridicule or point somebody's sins out it means that we help them get covered right and the only person that can cover sins is, is is Jesus Christ through his righteousness so we don't point the finger we don't we don't necessarily judge hypocritically however we don't ignore it either right you you can uh, you can be tolerant and walk away and ignore someone's sins but the real love is going to go tell them in a loving way hey this is a problem this is the bad news here's the good news Jesus says if you're if you're talking to a Christian just tell them look if you confess your sins God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins that's what you want always reconciliation and fellowship with the Lord so that's our second point hatred publishes sin but love covers it Somebody once said, judging a person does not define who they are. It defines who you are. Now it says, love believes all things. That's interesting. Does that mean that I have to be gullible if I'm being loving? Was Jesus gullible? He was loving, right? He is love. No, he wasn't. The Bible calls us to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, not the other way around, right? So to, be, to believe all things doesn't mean that we should be gullible. But it does mean that we should give people the benefit of the doubt. It's kind of like the justice system. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty. It, it means that I'm not going to judge you if you say, hey, I'm going to, hey, Albert, I'm, I'm going to commit to doing this. Okay, I'll, I'll take you at your word. If, if you don't do it, okay, well, maybe I'll learn next time around. But for everybody, at least in a general sense, if we're going to be loving, we, we got to take people at their word. We can't automatically judge them because of how they look or because of what so-and-so said about them. And then it says, love hopes all things. That's interesting because a lot of times we can be hopeless, especially because of the circumstances that we're going through. Well, I want to move out of Yuma already, you know, or I want, I want this in my life. I'm missing this. And, and we're never content. We're never content with, with Christ alone and with the person of Christ and with the work of Christ in our lives. We're never content with that. And we're always looking for something on the outside. We're always looking to change the, the circumstance. Change the scenery so we can feel better. But I tell you what, even if you change the scenery, even if you move somewhere else, it's not going to change it if you're not content right now with the Lord. So you've got to have, love really hopes all things. There are some people that are hopeless out there. And they should only identify unbelievers, but a lot of believers are hopeless. They're, they're in discouragement right now. They're suffering from discouragement, and, and the enemy loves that. The enemy loves to use that tool of discouragement because, see, if he can discourage you today, tomorrow you're not going to be doing anything for the Lord. He's going to stop you from serving God if you lack hope. And then he says, love endures all things. And that's a little bit different than long-suffering. Similar, but this is a, a, a more, more of a military term. It means literally to stand under, to remain under, to sort of hold the fort, remain under pressure. And we need that, right? We need endurance in our lives. We, we need to be able to, to endure all things. We need to be able to, to, to stay cool under pressure. How many of you have coworkers maybe that really get under your skin? Any of you? You all are retired people? All right. <laughs> Unemployed or retired? I did. You know, when I was working in, in the medical field for eight years, there was always this one girl that always got under my skin. And every time I, I, I dreaded working with her. So... She was still over there, and I would try to stay over here away from her because she got under my skin. I didn't want to ruin my testimony. And, you know, sometimes as guys, I think when we, when we give in to, uh, to an argument with the female, I think we've already lost it in, at, in that, at that point with somebody that, other than our wives, that is. Um, and, and I didn't want to do that. But I, now looking back, I saw what the Lord was doing. The Lord was changing me and giving me more love and endurance. And, and at the end of the day, I was seeking the Lord more because that brought me to his feet. I was like praying more. I wasn't being idle at work. And because the Lord brought that person there for a time being. 
So then, love endures all things. Now, we read what love is so far, and that brings us to our, our third point, right? Love has to be intentional. Love has to be intentional. Right off the bat, we've read that love is an action, right? It's something that we do. It's like putting on Christ and taking on. It's like putting on clothes and taking off clothes. It's something that we can do. It's accessible. You can't say, well, Albert, I've only been saved for uh, uh, half a year, six months. So I'm not really, uh, my love meter isn't that big. So I'm not, I'm going to stay away from loving people right now. Maybe in two years from now. That's not what it means because love, again, is a choice, right? Again, it goes back to not being a feeling, but a choice. Love must be intentional. And I love that word because that word means on purpose. It means deliberate. If I'm being intentional uh, about uh, something, I'm going to pre-plan. It's going to be something premeditated. For example, think of killing somebody and then murdering somebody. There's a difference there, okay? You can kill somebody accidentally, unintentionally. But when you murder somebody, it's always intentional. You pre-planned it. It was premeditated, right? So let's put that in the positive sense. Let's love people intentionally premeditatively, right? Let's plan to love others. And you know what? When you do that, when you plan ahead to love other people, it'll work out. Even God had a plan at the beginning. God already knew you were going to sin and I was going to sin. He already had a plan. He was intentional. The first prophecy in the Bible was found in Genesis 3.15. And this is what God says. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his Heal. God already had a plan laid out, and he was going to send his son. Notice the woman and the seed here. Women don't have seed. It's men. But because he was referring, to, fast forward to the Virgin Mary, and Christ was going to be born through her. So we see God already had a plan to love others, a sacrificial plan. Somebody once said, love is the active pursuit of the best for another person. Active pursuit. I like that word. Being intentional. I like that word as well. Why don't we start off in the home? Here's some homework for you guys. Start in the home, start with your wife and kids. If you're not married, well, start with those closest to you. If you have a wife, be intentional about loving her tomorrow morning. Maybe it's a cup of coffee. Maybe it's something simple like a little note on the fridge that says, I love you and before you head out to work or whatever. Or, or, and wives, do the same as well. What is your husband like? Well, I don't know, Albert. We'll find out. Find out and, and do it, right? Be intentional because that, that is pre-planning. For the next day. And that, that is what God has called us to do. To love your neighbor as ourselves. And do it with your kids. And then after that, do that with a random stranger. Do acts of kindness outside of the home. Because if you start outside and if you're not already doing it in the home, you're, you're doing it the opposite way. you got to love your, your, your wife as Christ loved the church. That is our, our, our first ministry aside from the Lord himself. Then, then we see what love isn't, and he's going to give us another list. Some might have a lot of things to say, but some I don't. First, he says, love does not envy. Love does not envy. Okay, you might be saying, duh. I know, love doesn't envy. That's like the opposite. It's like jealousy. But you know the difference between envy and covetousness? When I covet somebody, if I covet that camera over there, that means I want it. I would like that for me. But if I envy... That camera over there, I'm not, I can't really envy it, right? I'm, 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 envying, I'm envying the owner of the camera. I'm envying Bob. It's not that I want the camera. It's that I don't want Bob to have the camera. That's the difference, right? It's like that. what I was saying at the beginning. You put a baby that is playing in a, in a play plan, and there's two toys. It's already playing with, they're identical toys. It's already playing with one. The baby's forgotten about the other toy. You put another baby in there that grabs the other toy. What's the baby going to do that was already there first? Drop his toy. Take that, snatch that toy away and keep it. That's envy right there. You don't got to teach babies that. So the Bible says, don't envy. Love is not envious. Love is not um, hate. Love is not selfish. And notice what he says. Love does not parade it itself. And he's saying this also because the Corinthians were parading themselves. They were, you know, um, puffed up because of the gifts that they were exercising without love. They were probably speaking in tongues without interpretations and all that. They, they were making it a show, a pep rally. And Paul says, that's not love, guys. What I'm seeing here, what I'm hearing, because it was a letter that was written to him, what I'm hearing that is happening here, that is not love. It's a parade. That's, a, that's showboating. And you might, you know, I know some people are uh, um, introverted and extroverted. Some people that are more reserved, and there are others that like to be the center of attention. Now, I'm not saying don't be extroverted, but what I am saying is don't try to make it all about you. Okay? Don't try to make, take the the attention to yourself. Because see, love does not parade 
itself. It's not being about a showboat. It's about being humble. And then he says, love is not puffed up. And that means arrogant. That means uh, uh, proud. That's like the, uh, the cupcake without the margarine that puffed up, but it was dry inside. You see, some, the Corinthians, they had some knowledge. And they thought, well, look, we got some knowledge. We're, we know stuff. Oh, these, these people over here, they don't know stuff. And that's why Paul says, and what is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You see that? They had big heads, but they had small hearts. They didn't have the love. They had knowledge, maybe, but they weren't exercising the love. Again, I've said it before many times, but it's not about a big head. It's about a big heart. It's not about information. It's about transformation, right? So, so that's what Paul is trying to say here, because literally the word puff up means swell up. These Christians were, were swollen. And the next thing it says, love does not behave rudely. And that, that's something that we can break down, right? Because some guys, we can be a, we can joke around so much with each other, we can offend each other at times, right? And I understand camaraderie, I understand phileo love and all that. But if you're laughing at somebody instead of with somebody, there's a problem right there. That's unloving, right? So we, especially guys, we got to be careful with that. I mean, guys, we can joke around about our weight, but when it comes to ladies, well, that's, you know, it gets sensitive though, right? There are certain things that, are, that we don't do already that we already know. By the way, I don't get offended if you think uh, I've gained weight. Um, but um, you get what I'm saying. Love is going to be respectful. There are certain lines that we don't cross. You've got to be respectful, not rude, or make fun of people. Uh, the next thing is love does not seek its own. And that, that's, that's an interesting one because, you know, when we seek our own, we're being selfish. We, we, we reserve ourselves. We, um, what's the word? Segregate ourselves. We go off to the side and we say, well, this is... You know, this is my ministry over here. You don't touch it. This is mine. You stay away, right? And that's, that's not love right there. That's actually, you know, selfishness. Love doesn't seek its own. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about edifying you, right? It's about growing, you know, out and, and, and seeing what God can do here. Not about us. It's not my ministry. It's, it's his ministry. And then it says, love is not provoked. Another translation says, love is not easily uh, provoked. And remember when Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, you know that one of the fruits of the flesh is outbursts of wrath. Um, you know, I can relate to having some of those at times when you're, maybe you guys that have kids driving to church and you're driving your minivan or whatever you drive. The smaller the car, the more stress. If you got a bunch of kids, right? You have those yelling moments. Not, I'm not uh, saying it's okay, but what I am saying is love is not easily provoked. Love is, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be a hothead, guys. If you got a temper, you need to repent of that. You need to give that to the Lord. You can't be uh, e easily angered, okay? There's something going on there that you need to give to God. See, because we, we can't control the way people act, but we can control the way we react, okay? Don't let your reactions be under the power of another person's actions. Don't let other people get under your skin. The next one says, love thinks no evil or love holds no record of wrongs. And, I, you know, I've met people that actually have a list of, uh, they keep record of what other people do to them. It's, it happens a lot married, with married couples where, you know, they sort, it's sort of like a get out of jail free card. They keep a list of, you did this, but you don't know, I know. So when you give me a, a red card, I'm going to pull out the list where I'm keeping record of the things you've done wrong. That's not good because you know what? Love, it's not loving if you're bringing up something from the past. You don't, it's not forgiveness if you bring the past to the present, okay? Because see, for, to forgive somebody is to let go of that. It doesn't mean you forgot. It's still going to be there. A lot of things that maybe your, your husband or your wife has done to you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay there. It's going to remain. It's going to hurt if you think back and ponder about it, okay? But the Bible says if you forgive, if you really let go of it, don't bring it back up. Don't allow that to get in the way of the relationship now, don't, don't hold wrongs against others. Love doesn't do that. And the last one here, love does not rejoice in iniquity. You remember the Corinthians were, were taking each other to court? And back then, there was, it wasn't televised, obviously. There was no Judge Judy or Judge Joe Brown, but, but it was in public. So the church would go out into the middle of the town square, and they would have these... Uh, uh, they would have court, and unbelievers would see what was going on. You would have maybe a deacon over here arguing with an elder over here, and that person did this, and so on. One would win the trial, but he would lose his testimony, okay? 
When we do that, we lose our testimony. We should not rejoice in iniquity, immorality, or the downfall of a brother or sister. That is not good. That, that is not love. We should learn from these things. Now, verses 8 to 13, I titled, Love Never Ending. That is, love continues, guys. I'm almost finished here. Love, love continues. Love is going to be there in heaven as well. We're still going to need love in heaven. And Paul Brown for us, he says, Love never fails, in verse 8. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. That might be one of your you know, favorite passages or favorite verses in the Bible. What Paul is trying to say here is that the gifts right now, currently, presently, where he was at, those were being active. And I think that all the gifts are active today as well. I don't believe that we have apostles today. I don't believe that, that you know, I think it was the... The rules there for an apostle was Jesus had to pick him. Was, is Matthias a real apostle? I don't know. We'll see in heaven. We'll see whose name is on the pillar there, if it's Paul or Matthias. But the point is, Jesus had to pick him. They had to walk with Jesus. There might be some lowercase apostles that are like missionaries, like Barnabas or whatever. But as far as all the gifts being exercised today, I think, I think they are. But in heaven, will we need the gifts? Will we need the gifts when we are out of this fleshly body, temporary body? When we have an, an inherited the, the, the incorruptible, will we need the gifts? And I think what Paul is trying to say is no. When the perfect has come, I believe he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ when we see, and when we see him face to face here as well. He says, you know, now we see dimly or blurry. Back then when Paul wrote this, there weren't any mirrors. The, mirrors was, the mirror was not invented. You could have some shine metal, shiny metal or bronze or whatever, or copper, and you could somewhat see your reflection or in the water, but there was no mirrors, I think, till maybe the 12th century. And he wrote this, and it makes sense because in the future, just like in the future here, they would have mirrors, and we would be able to be with Jesus. We will be able to be with Jesus and see him face to face. We won't need knowledge because we're gonna, knowledge is going to be fulfilled when we're with Christ. He's going to let us know all these things, all the things we need to know. You know, even here where it says in verse 13, now, now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith is going to be fulfilled because we have faith in the future things. Hope is similar. Hope is going to be fulfilled. The blessed hope, being with Christ, it will be fulfilled. But love is always going to remain. And you know why love remains? Because God has remained throughout the ages. You know, before us, before anything, there was God. God was already there. God is love. So you can expect God to continue to be and, and who he is there and us being with them, love is going to continue to be there. And you might ask yourself, well, how do I get more of this love, Albert? I want more love in my life. What do I do? I know I can't sort of push it out. You know, it's not something I can uh, uh, do in my life. Manufacture. A lot of us try to manufacture love, but that's not what God wants you to do. Here's what Jesus says in, in John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you abide in me as I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. It's similar. It's interesting because Paul says, uh, I think it's in Philippians. He says, you know, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You know that? So then what Jesus is trying to say here is we got to be attached to the vine. And I think when, when, when we stop uh, getting in God's word, when we stop going to the feet of Jesus, we start detaching ourselves from him. I'm not, the more I remain in his word, the more fruit I, uh, will bear, I will bear in my life. Our last point is this. Love is dependent on our proximity to Jesus. Love is dependent on our proximity to Jesus. We've got to be attached to Jesus. You know, learn from Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha. I got that wrong in, in, in the... Somebody told me I got that wrong, that I said Martha instead of Mary. And everybody was like, He's, he was supposed to say Mary. And, the, and he said that, the next three sentences I said, nobody got because they were fixed on that. So Mary, all right? Mary, the sister of Martha. Every time we see Mary in the Bible, she's at the, with the same, at the same position, at, with the same posture. She's at the feet of Jesus. When Mary, Martha invited Jesus over to her house, she was busy cooking. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. She was learning from Jesus. She was hearing his word. Next time we see Mary, her brother died. Mary was... was 
was crying. Mary had, had sorrow, and, but she was at the feet of Jesus, right? And Jesus comforted her. I think that's where the Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus comforted her as well. We come to Jesus, to his word, with our sorrows and, and pains. But also then we see Mary anointing the feet of Jesus with a costly flask of oil. A year's worth of money, the one translation says. And then Judas is there hating on her, right? Mary is always at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, crying out to him, or, or in his word. She understood that Jesus was going to the cross as well. The more we abide in Jesus and his word, the more love we will have. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here, guys. Let's pray. If you're here this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to, to give your life to Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you know, maybe you're all saved. Maybe you're not. I don't know. But God knows. And you know. If you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, why not today? The Bible says that Jesus Christ came for you because of love. Same thing we're talking about today. The Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son because he loves you. There's nothing we can do to earn that. All we can do is accept it. If that's you this morning and you want more love in your life and you want the living God to save you, why not today? Call out to him. Cry out to him. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. I believe those words. I hope you do too. If that's you this morning, raise your hand and I can lead you in a prayer so you can confess, so you can believe in your heart. Don't put it off, friend. I don't see any hands. Lord, Father, I thank you again for this morning, Lord. I know I come short. I know we come short when we compare ourselves to, to this perfect love, Lord. But we want more love. We want more of you, Lord. We don't want to do things in the flesh anymore, Lord. We want to do things in the spirit, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.